Hello, welcome to our devotions. We are in the eighth chapter of Acts. We have been focusing on the events of the church when right after Stephen was stoned and killed and people left Jerusalem and started to spread through different areas of uh, the air, different areas of the kingdom, the empire, Roman Empire, in, in particular, Philip going into the area of Samaria. And it's important because this lays, get, we, we get so much information looking at this with regards to the landscape of our faith and the landscape of Christianity as we experience it and, and, and work our way through it, if you will, today. So we're going to take a, a look at the same um, same scriptures today and see if the Holy Spirit will give us um, some more um, insight as he so faithfully does. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. As we go into your word, thank you. For, we thank you for your spirit and ask that your spirit once again open up our hearts to hear what you have to say. You are good in every way. And we need your truth. We long for your truth. We long for your presence. So please open our eyes and ears to hear your word and to the truth of your word. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Verse 4 again. So those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. We talked about the power of proclamation. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. Okay, a city. Don't know the name of it, but he went down there. The crowds were all paying attention to what Philip said. As they listened and saw the signs he was performing, and verse 7 is the signs. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. There you go. This sets the stage. And you can see that in the same way when Jesus was proclaiming the kingdom of God, it was followed by signs and wonders. And even before the healings, one of the signs and wonders was the casting out of spirits. Um, they did, it's, not a, it's not a spooky thing. It, it, it can be intimidating, but it doesn't have to be. I remember one time, this is my own personal work. It, I, I would call it casting out, but what took place was I was with a friend, this is years ago, and um, I was just irritated with what was going on, just a general irritation. I don't know if you've ever had that, but I just was just irritated and, and uh, expressing my irritation, expressing my disappointment, if you will. And my friend said, I'll never forget it, as I was walking down the hall to use the restroom, my friend said, oh, that's self-pity wasn't said in terms of trying to give some kind of psychological diagnosis. It wasn't a Dr. Phil moment. It wasn't some kind of self-help thing. It wasn't any of that. It was calling out the reality of what I was, what I embodied. And as soon as my friend said that self-pity, I could recognize that for being exactly what it was. It wasn't me. It was a, a attitude, a, a, a voice, voice, an idea that had I've been carried and nursed for years and would pull out as a, as a card if things weren't going right, if things weren't going the way I thought they should, whatever the case may be, my thinking was wrong and this voice I listened to, poor me, whatever the case may be. And as soon as my friend said that to me and I recognized it for what it was, in other words, called it out, named it out, I, it no longer could be in me because the, the spirit of the living God dwells in us. And is jealous. He doesn't want any other spirit to influence, influence us. And I turned around, even before using the restroom, with the biggest smile, my friend said, looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, you just cast out a spirit or called out. Called out. Forget cast out. That can, that can be too dramatic, too Hollywoodish. Called out. And from that day on, I've never, I can honestly say, I've never had to deal with that. I've, it's tried to, on occasion, 
lure me into that state, into listening to it, but I don't succumb to it anymore. That's a great, that's a, my, it's, I don't want to say it's a small example because it wasn't small. If you've ever been having those kind of thoughts, um, they're, 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 they're irritating. They, they, they just steal all the joy. They are much more severe spirits, whether they're spirits of addiction, shame, perversion, uh, self-destruction, and resentment. There's just a, a ton of spirits out there, but they, they are called out for what they are when the gospel is proclaimed by the, the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, verse 9, there was a man named Simon. A man named Simon had previously practiced sorcery in that city and amazed the Samaritan people while claiming to be somebody great. This is important. He previously practiced. He did not practice it any longer, but he previously practiced it. He dappled in it. He was involved in it, and he was involved greatly because, as it says in verse 10, they all paid attention to him from the least of them to the greatest. And they said, this man is called the great power of God. He has a reputation, even though he may not have been doing it any longer. It was still within him. It's, it still was something that continued to work its way. I mean, the, 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 the occult, you never leave the occult. If you've dappled into the occult, it will never leave you. Once it's come into your mind, once it's come into your soul, it will not leave on its own. It must be driven out, cast out, called out by the Holy Spirit, or it will always dwell within you or a person. That's why the occult is so dangerous. Now, they were attentive to him in verse 11 because he had amazed them with his sorceries for a long time. That's why he said he was involved in the occult for a very long time. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, both men and women were baptized. Now this is, inc this is important, to believe. It's a, it's a word that I've talked about repeatedly um, because it's, there's one word in the Greek that we use different English words to try to describe or articulate what it means. The word in the Greek is pistos or pisteo. Pistos is the noun, pisteo is the verb. And we translate that one word to believe. We also translate that word if it's a noun, faith. Believe is more of a noun. I'm, I'm sorry, believe is more of a verb. Faith is more of a noun. Trust is also a word that we use to describe pistis, pisteo, and that means to trust. Those are very helpful words. They, they begin to embody what this Greek word means. It, it, I don't think it's entirely sufficient, though, in terms of getting at that word, because it, I also would add to it, devoted themselves. So, for example, if you believe in someone, you are faithful. We use the term faith, like I said, as, as an English word for this Greek word. But faith also means to be faithful. It's not just to recognize something as true, but to be faithful through it, to it. So, there's an element of devotion. There's also an element of recognition, if, for example, when they believed in Jesus all through his ministry, they did not know with regards to doctrine who he was. They didn't know he was the son of God. They didn't know that he was the eternal son of God. They didn't know that he had been uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit. They didn't know that he had been crucified, at least not until he was crucified, but for three years before that, they didn't know that about his crucifixion, his resurrection. They didn't know anything of that, but they could recognize that God was at work within him. And that recognition is believe, part of it. They recognized, they devoted themselves, they trusted himself. All these English words get at, and, and we, we need them all to fully understand that Greek word pistis. And so when we take a look at what we read here, um, but when they believed Philip, he is proclaiming the word. They believed what he said. They recognized the truth in what he said. They devoted themselves to that truth. They trusted in that truth. All of these 
as he proclaimed the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, both men and women were baptized, meaning now that they've heard this, it's recognized they are devoting themselves. They go through the ritual of baptism, which is a ritual of devotion. Baptism is an expression of devotion on our part to whom we are baptized into. So we're, Paul will say we're baptized into Christ. We are devoted then to him. And that devotion is 100%. It's like a military vow. You are devoting your entire life. You are sacrificing your entire life to this devotion. And this is what the ritual of baptism means. It's not an insurance policy. It's not some kind of incantation that if you say the right words, you get into heaven, you get God's blessing and his promises and so forth. It is an act, a responsive act of devotion. All through the scriptures, this is what baptism is. This is what human baptism is or water baptism is. It's not the same as a baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is something that Jesus does and only Jesus can do. In this realm, we practice water baptism because we demonstrate we need a ritual to express publicly our devotion and commitment to whom we are committing ourselves to. This is what took place in Samaria. Even Simon himself believed so he could recognize the truth. He recognized the truth of what Philip was preaching. And after he was baptized, he followed Philip everywhere and was amazed as he observed the signs of great miracles that were being performed. So he was baptized. He committed himself to Jesus could recognize the truth of what Philip was preaching, but he had practiced the occult. Years of practice have ingrained within him a way of thinking and being that was by its very nature contrary and opposed to the spirit at work when the gospel is proclaimed. He could recognize it was God, but to surrender to God and to give himself to God was beyond what he would was, was beyond what he was used to doing. When you practice the occult, you are in an arrangement where the whatever force you're trying to conjure, you are in an agreement where you will give them something, they'll give you something, you say the right incantations, you give this particular person money, they give you secrets, you use those secrets to perform and, and to, to uh, go into the supernatural, etc. That is not how God works. You surrender your entire life to God. And he then, as an act of mercy and of love and salvation, begins to transform who we are begins to transform how we think, begins to transform our nature, begins to transform our habits, begins to transform our entire being into his son. That's completely different than the occult. So while, he, while Simon could recognize the truth and see these miracles taking place, he did not have this heart necessary to be transformed by God. Verse 14, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. So now when, because remember, they're not Jews. These are Samaritans. They want to see what God is doing. God is now bringing into his fold people that are beyond the borders of Judaism historically and geographically, I might add. And so they sent Peter and John to them. After they went down there, they prayed for them so the Samaritans might receive the Holy Spirit because he had not yet come down on any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, which is what I was talking about. They gave themselves, but they have yet to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Um, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about more this a little bit later. Needless to say that when we give ourselves, when we devote ourselves, that's the water baptism. Jesus is the one that immerses us in his spirit. And gives us, he gives us as a gift, the Holy Spirit. 
God gives to us his son as a gift to us. It is all a gift that we receive. We don't earn it. This is the key, key principle here. Simon thought he could earn it. And in so doing, whenever that mentality comes into the situation, it ushers in pride. You cannot earn it. It's something to be received humbly. And you can't even perform humility. Um, yet that too is a gift. Well, we're going to get into this even more next time. In the meantime, may the peace of God be with you. And may his Holy Spirit fill you with his presence. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.